So, um, Unicraft, that's a new project um, which is covered under, well, let's say it's an incubator open source project, uh, part of the Zen project, and also covered by the Linux Foundation. And it's all about unicorns in, in this project. So, let's see if I get you guys convinced because my aim is to get as many contributors uh, to this project and, and get this thing growing because it's a super nice topic actually for me. So, what are unicorns? So what are they for and um, what are they actually? I don't know if uh, anybody of you heard about that already. So, but I think I'm pretty sure that you heard about this container craze, right? Everybody is running uh, their services in a container. You hear sentences like Google runs all its services in a container. Then you have suddenly things like Amazon Lambda, uh, Google Container Engine, and Azure Container Services, and so forth, uh, popping up. But why are containers so popular currently? The thing is that uh, if, you, if you deploy your service with a container, you, you get some, some benefits. For instance, uh, very fast instantiation times of your service, like in, in, in the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Um, you have a really small uh, memory footprint for each of your um, container, for instance, a Docker container and so forth, which basically depends more on the application that you have in that box. Um, <laughs> It enables you a higher density, like you can run hundreds or thousands of uh, container instances on a, on a single host. And if you take this and look at VMs, VMs look just, you know, heavyweight, fat, inflexible, right? Thousand, thousand instances of VMs on a single host? I don't believe that. <laughs> but at the same time, when we talk about container, we need to um, also be careful about some certain security risks. I'm not saying that they're there, but it's a, a bit more risky in terms of, 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 of development. The reason is actually coming from that all the containers, they, they share a, a same kernel and also the, its API. And the kernel API are system calls. And um, this isolation is implemented by putting in checks and, and so forth into each of the system calls and you know if you see on IO control or get other system calls, um, it can get quite complex for each of the system calls. And also if you, we check the latest Linux releases, the system call numbers is incredibly increasing compared uh, to hyper call numbers on, on, a, on a, hyper, a hypervisor. So of course I don't need to tell you if one container uses a system call which is not really uh, protected securely uh, and you break out, your whole system is in danger. So usually the trade-off that you have today is kind of a picking of poison choice, right? So either you go for containers, you know that they're lightweight and you have these uh, super fast popping up services, but kind of maybe not well <laughs> night uh, because you know the isolation might be a bit iffy. When you go to hypervisors, of course they promise you strong isolation because they use CPU features for doing that, but they're pretty heavyweight. But now, I hope I can break the mood with you that VMs are actually heavyweight because we have this thing like unicorns now. So what is it, a unicorn? So on the left side you see a traditional VM, right? So you run your service within your virtual machine. It has a general purpose operating system underneath and some, some, some kernel features. So what is different when we run our service in a unikernel? So first of all, we run it also in, in the same virtual machine isolation protection boundary. But instead of using the general purpose uh, kernel underneath, we built a purpose-built thin kernel layer under the application that has only the features that the application requires. And then you can do even assumptions like, uh, since you run anyway one application in, in one virtual machine domain, you could even weak up the isolation between kernel and user space and can start even optimizing the interface between application and the kernel 
because that kernel layer is anyway purpose-built for that application. So benefits you get even further from this specialization step where you say, okay, I have now optimized uh, uh, functions to enter my kernel or my driver. So in numbers, um, in this graph you see on the, on the horizontal axis a uh, number of uh, concurrent instances deployed in the system. Um, and on the, on the uh, vertical axis, the, the deployment time. And I start here with comparing the numbers, how long it takes to, to bring up a process. Um, and we are roughly there in, in, in a bulk part that we, it doesn't take longer than 10 milliseconds to pop up processes, processes, and processes. So if you use then Docker and put that process, sorry, I forgot to say that process is doing nothing. It's like just a black box, his baseline measurement here. So if you put that in a Docker, that boot time increases and we end up roughly in the ballpark of 150 milliseconds to 550 milliseconds, which is pretty good because uh, it still, it, at least it promises you to give you more uh, protection than just running the, the processes blind on your system. If you compare that with um, Debian boots, so meaning a, a, as a representative of a traditional VM, that number goes up from 2 to 6 seconds in, in the best case and when you have 1,000 concurrently running on that system going even up to 82 seconds. So here I agree, if I see that graph, yeah, traditional VMs are really heavyweight for, you know, these agile services. But if you take now a unicorn, so this one is, uh, is, is, is called uh, MiniOS, uh, this is part of the, the Zen project, it was more for educational purposes. But if you just take that, build it, and also do a no-op in there, um, we are roughly already in the same ballpark than containers, meaning it shows um, that unicorns are similar as fast as, as containers. So now you maybe heard of uh, a recent publication that we did that we called LiveVM. So we are we're actually tackling into that system uh, on, on, on the Zen system to figure out actually where it's all my time spent when I pop so many VMs. And uh, we figured that most time is lost in the VM management code. So we replaced that, put, put, in, uh, put a complete own management tool set on top, and ended up um, creating VMs, even if you go up now up to 8,000 concurrent instances um, between 5.2 and 8.6 milliseconds. And it's the same unicorn as before. And as a comparison, um, Docker, we run out on the same machine, which has actually 128 gigabytes of DDR3 memory. Uh, we run out at uh, 3,000 Docker instances. So this shows that there's an immense potential in, in unicorns, uh, which is not used yet. So, the gains of unicorns when you run them in a, in a virtualized environment are fast instantiation, so we know that from Docker, but we found even it can go even to tens of milliseconds down. We have also a low memory footprint. Um, the, we can achieve really high density, as you just saw on the graph. And now the more pluses come, which is due to the specialization that we can do, to, let's say, um, optimize our kernel layers towards the application, we can achieve even higher performance. And we had some unicorns built in the past, one for what was a static HTTP server that was able to cope almost with 40 gigabits uh, of throughput. Uh, and sa having said that, it had only a single guest CPU assigned for this. And also, uh, the attack surface is reduced because um, you have less components in a unicorn, right? And your unicorn has also the kernel layers with it, so you don't have kind of this uh, shared kernel approach. And the other extra is the strong isolation that your, your virtual machine box gives you. So now you may ask me, cool, uh, where would I like to use it? And the thing is, um, Depending on these technology advantages, uh, the, the use cases are quite wide-ranging. Kind of, you pick 
pick uh, on one of the differentiators that you, you gain with unicorns. So to give you some examples, fast boot times and migration times, you would like to have it for reactive uh, VNFs, so meaning you have a DDoS attack in your telecom operator network and you pop up on the fly a, a, a blocking firewall in front of that access and your DDoS is, is, is gone. Lambda functions um, as well, you boot them up for running a single, single function and then kill them afterwards, so you don't want to have something really heavyweight that takes forever to come up. The other, the other differentiator is the resource efficiency, which comes from this minimal uh, software stack. There you can imagine also for telcos, so you notice I have a kind of a bit uh, telco background. You could imagine you could run uh, for each customer that you serve your internet connection a, a VNF because you can run thousands of them on, on a single host. But also resource efficiency gets quite important when you go into embedded areas like IoT or you know, mobile edge computing where you don't have that many resources that you actually can waste. High performance, of course, is a super hot topic for network function virtualization, but also mobile edge computing, including other stuff too. And then mission critical. So, as Lars said, this is quite difficult to, to get your code certified. Of course, we don't have this development model yet in Unicraft, but at least we can promise that the code base is small, which makes already all this, uh, you know, the price for verification much cheaper. Then we have the strong isolation between our systems because of the hypervisor, and this is really interesting for, yes, you saw it, for automotive applications or any other industrial grade uh, virtualization solutions. So now you say, probably cool, but why don't I have a unicorn, right? Why is this not there? And the thing is, the devil is in the detail. Such optimizations that you saw of so these, these optimized unicorns are for now manual build. And it takes usually months or even longer to get it really working that way. And the, the, the biggest issue is actually that it's kind of a throwaway. You go, go through a process a couple of times again for each of the different applications because you want to specialize your kernel layers differently depending on the application that you want to port in the unicorn. So in practice, this looks like when you take, uh, for instance, Nginx, and you want to have a unicorn, you would probably start to run it on a general purpose OS and, and see what's, what's there. And you will notice that you know, many libraries, uh, many kernel features even are completely unused and are not necessary to run your service. So what you then would start is like building a system, just picking these necessary pieces which is already lots of work, especially when, you, when I say uh, you take some pieces of the kernel out um, to, to, get, to get your unicorn. But then, on the second iteration, you probably will start um, replacing, let's say, some libraries with different implementation because you figured out that that application performs much better with that or maybe you have a more resource-constrained uh, KPI. So, you start tweaking and tuning the whole system until you reach what you want to have, right? And this Unicraft project is actually all about these steps. How can we simplify that? How can we reduce the amount of work that you have to do in order to get your engine X in the Unicron box? So when we started uh, with this project, we had, we had the following motivation behind. First of all, um, this unicorn build framework um, should support everyone's use case. This means uh, that some people are really concerned about what, what does your network drivers do, what, uh, um, in sense, what does your CPU, um, Kind of, kind of, they, they're really picky in, in, in which way network packets are scheduled to CPUs to process uh, it for, for NFV. And others um, take care more about memory allocators to get better performance for different services. So the framework should support all of that. 
It should, for sure, simplify the building and optimization, as I promised. And um, we want to build this unicorn framework also to get rid of this throwaway attitude, meaning that hopefully, since you heard this now, <laughs> more unicorn projects are starting to build their unicorns based on Unicraft, so that all the efforts they did to get their application run is collected in a single base and may be beneficial also for other people. And the design approach that we have chosen is everything is a library. And when I say everything is a library, I mean even um, decomposed OS functionality like schedulers, memory allocators, and drivers, they are all libraries. And uh, Unicraft for now consists of two components. You have a library pool, which I hope we can together increase it, and a build tool that simplifies your building and uh, optimizing your, your Unicron. <laughs> so we're going to talk now of, about uh, operating system decomposition. What's the issue here? The thing is that, let's say, let's take Linux or, or BSD. These systems are usually monolithic and really tied together. Um, what we actually want is like a library for each of these components, like a library just for supporting file systems, because you could imagine you have unicorns that don't need file systems at all. Or you want to have schedules as a separate library or you know, memory allocators and so forth. So, so the challenge is here to take some OSs and pick some pieces out and redevelop it in a way so that it gets a more self-contained uh, uh, box that you can plug in and out for your unicorn build. So let's have a look to the library pool that I said as one component of Unicraft. So we distinguish currently between three types of libraries. First is the main library pool, which includes OS functionalities, file systems, schedulers, network stacks. And the goal is even, you know, even to provide new alternative um, implementations. Like you have Linux with tons of different file system implementations and you pick the one that fits most for your use case. We want to have this for schedulers, for network stacks. Let's say you have lightweight IP or you have the, the BSD network stack ported. And depending on the application, one or the other is, is, is a better fit for you. Then we have the platform libraries. These are actually the libraries that implement the, uh, really the, the thinnest layer down to your hypervisor. Um, we have support for now for Zen. Uh, we can run on KVM, and there is there is there is one target for uh, Linux user space for debugging purposes. And then there are some architecture libs that some CPU architect architectures uh, may require. For instance, on ARM 32-bit, we had to provide 46-bit um, uh, arith arithmetic uh, operations in software for modulo and division. So in the ideal case now, you, pick, you, you select your app, then you select and config the libs with the build tool, which I show in the next slide, and then the rest should happen magically, and you get your, all your unicorn images that are optimized for these various platforms. So for instance, you would have one uni, uh, unicorn image for KVM, you would have a different image for Zen, because Zen needs different drivers, the interface is different, but you, can, you, know, you specialize it for Zen and the other for KVM, and so forth. So the build tool um, is, for now, kconfig based. So you know it from, from the Linux kernel when you played around with that. And has some makefile magic. <laughs> Actually, I learned a lot about makefile by doing this. <laughs> um, so you have the same principle as when you build a Linux kernel. You have a make menu config. Then you select your, your options and libraries you want to have for your application. You select your target platforms where you want to have an image built for it. And you save your config and type make. And then that's it. <laughs> so to make this uh, a bit more clear, also with a, a bit more uh, a closer example, let's say we would build a Python unicorn. We would say uh, we take the Python interpreter and take that as an, as an application. 
we feed that to the to the Unicraft system, and then we select like uh, a network stack to get socket operations. We would select uh, an, uh, a fitting uh, memory allocator, console driver, and so forth. And Unicraft builds us the Unicraft. With another example, maybe some of you heard already about ClickOS. Um, it is a, a small uh, VNF unikernel where you actually use the click router software and you do the same thing, right? You, you select the components you need and Unicraft builds it for you. So, the uni... Any question? No. Okay. So the, the Unicraft um, open source release, we started with version number 0 0.2 <laughs> with the code name Titan. Um, so let me briefly introduce what we have now. Um, the, the library pool consists for now really of basic functionality to get that thing you know, running and up and for people getting their hands dirty as quick as possible. So it's not full fledged now. So I expect much more libraries in the future. But for instance, we have a, a memory allocator ported for MinuS, which is, uses the bu binary body allocator principle. We have libraries for debugging. We have a, a scheduler interface. Um, there's, there's soon, besides the cooperative scheduler, there's a library coming up for preemptive scheduling. Platforms uh, we support is Zen, KVM, and Linux for now. And um, most of them run on both on x86 and also uh, smaller ARM boards uh, with ARM v7 uh, CPUs. So when you build now with Unicraft something, let's say a library, you, you, will, you will bind it to this uh, core um, Unicraft repository, which has internal libraries, the makefile system, and the kconfig system. So in each library, uh, what you need to do, besides having the source code, you need to provide a config.uk, which is actually kconfig syntax to provide your configuration interface and a makefile.uk, uh, which gets sucked in by the makefile system to do this build for the library. You can do at the same time, provide the library also externally by uh, using an external repo. The structure is exactly the same as internal libraries, and the system it allows you that an external library can replace an internal library, because it's just a menu item where you then select a different one. And your application in this build system is also just a library. So the same thing, you have a makefile.uk and a config.uk. The only difference is you have an entry makefile here, which looks like when you develop uh, an, an, a Linux kernel module off tree, um, looks like, like the same thing. It just you know, calls the makefile system of Unicraft, handing over all the paths of where your sources are and then that system sucks everything in and uh, builds you uh, the bigger menu and um, automates the, the compilation. To give you a baseline example of what we achieved uh, with the first build we could do with that tool, this is a Zen uh, para-virtualized guest um, that actually just boots and comes down and, and shuts down afterwards and prints some debug mes messages that it rolls up. The VM image, or the VM kernel image actually, because we don't need disk files or nothing there, is just 32.7 kilobytes of size. Um, you, in this pie chart, you roughly see how the, the space is, is distributed uh, among the libraries that we had to select. Most of the things go to the platform library that in, uh, implements the interface to the Zen hypervisor. And we can boot and print it. And since it's so minimalistic, we were also trying out how much, what's the minimum amount of RAM we need to assign to get it actually up. And even we had to change it to the, the tool stack to, in order to get that. Um, because it's limited to four megabytes. So the Zen community thought four megabytes is the least amount of RAM you assign to a VM. We could assign with, we could boot it with 208 kilobytes of RAM only. So now I want you, I hope you are all convinced now. <laughs> um, so please join us. So, so the project, um, as, as, as I said in the beginning, uh, was 
accepted as an incubator project under the Zen community, which is, by the way, a really great open uh, community and uh, uh, really supportive. Um, and we need you now for our ambitious goals, because that library pool needs to increase in order to make that really useful for many people. So if you're interested, please have a look to our Zen pages uh, and for the Unicraft project, or drop us an email on our mailing list, or even join our IRC channel. So the core Unicraft teams should be present there all the time to answer some questions. And if you're kind of in the mood like, yeah, I would, I would like, but I have no idea what I could do here, we have a huge list of open topics, even written down in the, in, in the Zen Wiki. So just get in touch with us, we can find something uh, that might interest you as well. Okay, then let's show you a small demo of this uh, Hello World um, Unicorn, so that uh, I prove that it's real and not a lie. And then we can go for, for a question round. So this is now my development system. As you see on the bottom of the screen, this is like uh, top, but this is the Zen version of top, so it lists you the virtual machine that they're running in the system. And on the bottom, you have, you have, you have my shell. So let's um, start with make menu config, because that's the first thing we want to do. Um, to show you how the, the, the menu looks like. So you could you, you select first your architecture you want to build your, your application as Unicorn Core. And you can choose between x86 and ARM. Since my, my VM is x86, I keep that one. On platform, you select what you want to have. So here it's already enabled as an image. Let's say I also want to build an image that's optimized for KVM. Or we take also one that runs in Linux user space because of the wide debugging tools that we can use there. Then this is the library pool for now. Um, here we can select, unselect, or configure even uh, the libraries. There are also some hard dependencies selected by the application already and also by the platform. So for instance, a minimalistic libc is required by the platform, so you can't unselect it, but if you have a full-blown libc, you can replace that no libc with whatever you have, let's say glibc, new libc, you name it. Um, yeah, they're all configurable, as you see here. In UK debug, you can uh, enable a certain debug object. Okay, then you save your configuration. Type make. And you see it builds all the library libraries separately and then links uh, the final image with the according libraries together. This looks like this in the build directory. So this is our uh, KVM image, which is 40 kilobytes of size. And we have also a compressed version, which is 8 kilobytes of size. Um, we have one for Linux user space, and we have here one for Zen. It's slightly bigger now because it uh, adds a memory allocator as well. So this is a bit more for than on the slide that I showed you before. To prove you that it runs, I first show you that it runs on Linux user space. Here, here we go. And now I will create uh, the Zen guest. So I have some scripts around the tool stack to simplify that a bit. Let's assign, I don't know, four megabytes of memory. Let's start working. And here we go. And it's already dead already. So meaning it was so quickly up and down that we didn't see it down there. So what I have added to this example is a, a busy loop so that I can prove that it's actually a VM. So I go to the application options, enable this, save it. So now the unicorn is not going down anymore. It's now wasting the CPU by just busy looping. But at least you see the VM exists. And now we run it again. Yeah. 
and now you see. So the, the Zen tools are not, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not prepared for, you know, VMs that come and go in the seconds. So now, um, any questions? I put you uh, the sources again for, you know, that you have time to write the down, write them down. Um, it's also possible to meet me at the Zen booth. Um, I can show you also another demo with, uh, with another unicorn. And yeah, we can have a chat. So yeah, please your question. Ah, yes, I know what you mean. And so that, what, that image that we have for now is built... Oh, sorry, yeah. The question was if you use KVM tool to run that unicorn instead of chemo for KVM. The platform library that we have for now supports only the chemo version and, and can, can be booted with the, with the direct kernel booth. Let's say using a KVM tool makes definitely sense. I think it will improve the boot times for KVM as well. Uh, they, I know there is a project uh, driven by, by the Mirage OS uh, Unicorn guys and IBM guys, uh, which is called UKVM. So they, they even uh, give one, go one step further and provide a different abstracted hypervisor interface. But in principle, you can all integrate that into Unicraft. What, what Unicraft is concerned about is only that the library needs to be there to support that case. Yes, yes. I know you could even, you know, share the host TCP IP stack and give give uh, sockets. Yeah. Any other question? So, so the question. You mean the, the Python algorithm? Okay. So the question is about how to include when when you build now something like a Python language interpreter as a unicorn, how to include like uh, Python libraries into that whole unicorn system. So for now, my answer would be um, either you kind of. Uh, Use, use an intermediate language of, of your, your Python interpreted. You, you know, you don't run the interpreted language in a unit kernel, you would kind of compile it with Python compiler, get these object files and build that together as, as an image. Alternatively, you can also use the Python interpreter, add a file system underneath, attach a disk image and uh, run your Python code directly interpreted um, and load the, the, the Python libraries from there. Yeah? <laughs> yes? That's actually a good question. So microkernel is actually, um, um, so the question was, how is it different from microkernels, the, the, the unicorns? So the question, uh, so, well, my answer is, it's, it's a, a different system design. Unicorns are still monolithic. So it's a, a single kernel image where you include the features that you need. So you don't, um, you know, decompose into several server processes, uh, your, your file system, Support and so forth into into other protection domains. You keep it included in your in your unicorn. So there was a question behind. <laughs> so the question is, what are the ambitious goals, and where do I want to want to go? So the the target is really that this is kind of. Um, build framework for future unicorn projects. 
meaning I would like to see UKVM, as you mentioned here in the first row, also included as a, as a library there that simplifies you building your application as a unicorn. Um, also, I, you know, maybe it changes the way how you do uh, IoT. Uh, you could imagine this is an enabler for multi-tenant IoT platforms where you run a hypervisor on a resource constrained uh, uh, device and then you know you deploy your IoT services as, as virtual machines and since the resources are um, uh, scarce um, a unicorn would be a fit if you don't want to settle on, on, on containers for instance. So I, I would really want to see that project going into several directions kind of, you know, multiple use cases like NFV, IoT, you name it. So it should, it should, it should be a, the starting base to simplify your unicorn project, actually. Yes? So the question is about the license that we have chosen for Unicraft. So Unicraft is a BSD 3 clause license. So I hope, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's good enough for most of the things that you want to do. So of course what you couldn't do is now taking something from Linux and, and, and put it in there because you might get the license complex but you could still take the VSD network stack and put it as a library and have something uh, feature rich as a networking stack in there. Any other questions? The question is about how to, um, you know, select dependencies, how, how that works in this build tool. So all this dependency handling is, is now built into these config.dk files. So when you have your Nginx applications, you kind of still need to do a bit of analyzing step to, to understand what are, what are the dependencies that, that I need. Um, and you would, you would write them down as library dependencies to the Unicraft system or feature dependencies that you need. Let's say you need a socket interface, so the user would need to provide you a TCP IP stack that comes with a socket interface, as an example. Or you need a, a VFS, so you, you define, I need VFS layer, <laughs> please give me one. And then you select a, a coding library to it. So that is all bundled into this conflict of view case. Okay, another question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the question is, uh, how is this different from Erlang and Zen? I can tell you, Erlang and Zen is Minuas and the Erlang language on top. You maybe heard also of other unicorns like um, Mirage OS, which is Originally, also, MinUS, and you have an OCaml uh, environment, and then you even write, develop some drivers in OCaml. The thing is, it's not really different. It's like, you know, you could, you could build these unicorns with this uh, project too. The thing is that when these projects started, there wasn't a single place where people contributed to. It. And this is kind of, you know, the issue that I was mentioning that the unicorn for now is more or less a throwaway thing. So you build your unikernel, go through all these optimization steps and so forth, but it's just for this use case, right? And it's not uh, going back uh, to, to a single place where other people could um, get something from it. And also the plan is also to get, uh, let's say, Mirage running with, with uh, Unicraft platform libraries underneath. Okay. Thank you very much.